Hello boys and girls, welcome to another episode of Folks Brow. Today on the bench behind me I have one of these uh, Samsung 40 inch LED TVs. Uh, we don't know what the problem is, we're going to find out together. We're going to change the format of the show a little bit. Uh, uh, from now on, basically, uh, we're going to be, be a bit more uh, focused on the fault finding as well as the cost implications of the repair. I'm very well aware of the crisis going around the world with uh, COVID-19 and if uh, you guys are anything like us in South Africa, um, I think uh, repair is going to become a thing again. You're not going to just turf out your TV and get a new one if it breaks or whatever. You will be focused on the repair. So I'm going to focus on the fault finding techniques and give you insight into that. Let's get to the bench and let's see what's wrong with this TV. Right, here we have our 40 inch uh, TV on the bench. I've put the power cord in. Let's switch the power on and see. Okay, we can hear it starts up. Uh, no picture. Typical, typical, typical indication of a backlight problem. What I'm going to do, I'm going to swing the uh, TV around, take the back cover off, and then we can take some measurements together and see where we are with this thing. Right, we have the back cover off, and as we can see, there's really not much to this TV, and there's really not much to modern TVs these days anyway. We have a power supply board here. You can see the power comes in over here. Power supply does its magic. We'll come back to that now. On the left here, we have our main board. This is going to do all the video and signal processing that we need. As we can see, we've got uh, HDMI ports there, a USB, uh, normal RF antenna. Uh, we don't see RGB. Uh, wait, there we go, RGB. Uh, so red, green, uh, red, green, and blue composite video. If we look at this, we noticed we didn't have any uh, screen. We didn't have any picture, but we had a sound and everything. It went bing, 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 whatever its startup thing is. So pretty much we can write that board off. That board will be fine. Down here on the bottom, this is known as our timing control board. It controls the horizontal and vertical synchronization of the signal. Again, we didn't see a picture, so I'm not even going to worry about that for the moment. I'm pretty sure our problem lies here. If I just move this up a little bit, what you can see is there's a line that goes off the back here off this part of the power supply into the back and that will go to our backlight so these TVs backlights are lit by LEDs light emitting diodes light emitting diodes are current driven devices not voltage diff uh, driven although you do need voltage uh, the current is what controls the device the brightness the uh, uh, luminance of the of the LED so being a current driven device that is normally what is going to go because that is what is working hard what a lot of these manufacturers do when you buy this TV and do your, do yourself a favor go into your remote go into your setup and have a look at it and you will notice that the backlight is turned to 100 percent to flat out so in other words the led will have a shelf life of a couple of thousand hours at full brightness uh, that is planned obsolescence. it is deliberate they want the leds to burn out so that you come back and buy a new one the other thing that they do typically is these capacitors that are working hard uh, the power is out so i can uh, touch around here 
these capacitors, these bulk storage capacitors, these electrolytics, uh, they will rate them for 85 degrees Celsius. Uh, again, a capacitor has a shelf life of a certain amount of hours. The closer you run it to its rated temperature, the quicker you're going to get uh, those rated hours. For example, if the capacitor is rated for 4,000 hours at 85 degrees Celsius, that means within 4,000 hours at the temperature running at 85 degrees Celsius, the capacitors will dry up and die. If you, however, run the 85 degrees Celsius rated capacitor at uh, 40 degrees Celsius, you're pretty much doubling the life. Uh, not quite, but uh, you get the idea. So typically they will put in 85 degree rate, uh, Celsius rated capacitors and they will bugger out. So normally what we do is we, if we get these things, um, we will put in a temperature rated capacitor of at least 105 degrees Celsius. Um, but in our case, when we put the power on, it did its little startup thing and we heard the little uh, jingle. So this part of the circuit, in other words, the AC is coming in down here. It's going through our fuse. It's going through uh, a bunch of varistors and uh, looks like a nice NTC there. Some common mode chokes, these big uh, copper wound things or common mode chokes. It's uh, filtering some safety, safety capacitors. Again, filtering more surge protection, more mobs. It gets rectified. The AC gets converted to DC, so 230 volts here in South Africa. Uh, rectified, you will now have 325 peak on that side. So the AC wave now becomes like that. We're looking at the peak value. That'll be 325 volts on that side. Again, it will be a thing with a trough. And that is why they've got these bulk smoothing capacitors in. So pretty much I don't see any problem here because we had sound and the sound, the speakers down here, are coming off that board there and here's the other speaker down here so this thing started up its processor fired everything and it gave us our little jingle so that side of the power is is working fine what we need to do now is find out if that side of the power is working fine and this is really not too difficult if we look at the circuit here we have an optocoupler in here. It's marked here hot. We can see there's a, a line in here going underneath that transformer like that. So this is the hot side of the power supply. In other words, uh, the AC, the high voltage, the, uh, the bite you and hurt you side. This side here will be now the cold side of the power supply. Uh, we can see that this is a BN44-00- uh, sorry, dash 00666D variant of this power supply. It's got a whole bunch of markings here. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move the camera forward and we're going to zoom in a little bit and you can see some of those markings. Right, first things first, let's see if we can get in on that block there. It tells us we have an A5V bus, 5.3 volts at 10 milliamps, it looks like, or 18 milliamps, whatever, from this power supply that can drive that. We have a B5V bus, a 5.3 volt bus that can drive 1.2 amp. We have a B13V a volt bus, a 12.8 volt bus, which can give us 1.9 amp. Uh, a V amp bus, again, 12.8 uh, volts at 0.4 amp. And funny enough, underneath here, CNL802, uh, the LED bus can give us 135 volts at 425 milliamp. Uh, we come up. 
sorry for the bumping. We have uh, another bus or uh, connector pinout, and this would be typically for this connector here. It will tell us pin one on the right hand side, pin two on the left hand side, so one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and what do we have here? So on, on the right hand side, pin one, we have 13 volts. Uh, on the left hand side, we have the PWM underscore DM, so pulse with modulation dimming for the screen. Uh, 13 volt, 13 volt, um, BLU on off, backlight on off, I, I would guess, and V amp, ground, V amp, ground, ground, A5, V, B5, V, and remember we saw what they were down there, and our PAL on off, B5, V. Now, out of these signals up here, the only thing that interests me is this backlight on and off not the power on off i'm sure because we're getting the jingle that means that that voltage is present remember a lot of what this power supply does is it will talk to the main board over there and find out if everything's okay with it that will come back and say yes i'm okay you can start up whatever sub processes that you have so i'm pretty sure that we will find that the power on off is present so I wouldn't even worry about it and I'm pretty sure that the backlight on off will be there um, without even having to check that what we can do is if I come to the right and just zoom out a little bit if we check these signals up here, let me change the focus. If we check this, these signals up here and this circuitry up here out, we will know whether we're giving voltage to the backlight and switching it through. Of course, we need to know a little bit about this circuitry here. We have a TO220 package here heatsink that is more likely than not a MOSFET a metal oxide field effect transistor uh, don't worry too much about it all you need to know is it's driven by voltage if I put a certain amount of voltage on the gate it will switch on if it's a N channel MOSFET uh, if it was a P channel mass MOSFET the reverse is true uh, in this case I'm guessing it's going to be an N channel MOSFET so we will put a uh, voltage onto the gate. In other words, the pulse width modulation will put voltage onto the gate to switch this thing on. Uh, if I'm looking at this properly, I'm going to guess that this is a buck converter. So it's taking the voltage up that is coming from this transformer down here and it's controlling it. It's stepping it down to give us a controlled voltage over here but not just a controlled voltage I'm guessing what they would do with this is they would uh, drive a constant current into the backlight remember we said our LEDs are current driven devices well if I can control the amount of current I can control the brightness so I'm guessing that is our switching MOSFET of course I will draw this out in, uh, in, uh, so we can have a look at it this big resistor here will be our current sense resistor in other words we need to tell whatever I see is driving this thing right I'm the, your pulse width modulation is, is is reached the right amount your algorithm is working fine the current being drawn is what we have uh, given as a set point so this will be our feedback our current sense our feedback resistor to whatever I see on the back of this thing is controlling this we have an inductor here our inductor will serve to control the ripple remember we are dealing with a uh, looking at this layout we are dealing with a constant current supply so 
to store that current, that is what that inductor is for. Inductors doesn't like to see a change in, in current flow. So a inductor does to current what a capacitor does to voltage. Remember, a uh, capacitor doesn't like to see a change in DC voltage. So if the voltage uh, speed, uh, peaks, the capacitor will store it. And in the trough period, the capacitor will release that charge. The inductor does the same thing only for current. So we have that there. And up here, it looks like we have a little bit of a you can't see it because of the capacitor, but there's a diode, so that will be our... Uh, I can't really see the marking on it, but that will be our flyback diode. Interesting to note, I'm just going to zoom out again, and to come down... What I want you to notice is the power connector. There's only two pins, live and neutral, or line, uh, or American hot and cold, but in South Africa, live and neutral. So there is no earth coming to this. So we have to be very careful if we wanted to hook up an oscilloscope to this, where are we going to probe? What we can notice is there are two uh, looks like two grounds no I'm talking snot so this side is floating this side the chassis up here if we just come up you can see there that's tied to the chassis so the zero volt is tied to the chassis so that is our cold ground reference we cannot hook up an oscilloscope just willy-nilly down here unless we use something like a differential probe or we put this under a isolation transformer. In other words, we float the device under test. So then we don't care of the polarity of our live and neutral because what you have to know is an oscilloscope uses Earth as a reference to measure and Earth uh, in South Africa, depending on your on your wiring scheme, just know at home that your neutral is earth referenced. So you have a 50-50% uh, chance if you go and hook up your earth of your oscilloscope that you're going to actually connect it to live, in which case you'll blow your oscilloscope to pieces. Uh, that's best case. Worst case is you uh, hurt yourself as well. So what I'm going to do I'm going to hook my multimeter negative up to here and we're going to probe around here. So we can see, is this voltage going to the LEDs? Have we got supply to the LEDs? And is it coming back? Because that MOSFET will actually switch through that current sense resistor. One side of it will go to whatever OBAMP is measuring or whatever chip they're using. The other side will go to ground. So if we're getting a voltage on one of these legs, then we know that that is switching through. And if we know the voltage is going out, then what we know is the LEDs themselves are stuffed. They are maybe open circuit or whatever. In which case, if the LEDs are open circuit, we will not get a voltage here. But we will know what this transistor or MOSFET is doing. So let's have a look at that. Right, here we are with the multimeter hooked up. I still haven't plugged the power in, we'll do that now. All I've done is I've taken the negative lead of my multimeter, or the common lead, and I've clamped it to the chassis because we know that is our cold side uh, ground reference. I'm going to put power on, but what I want to do is I just want to show you I've changed my lead or my probe tip to a sharp point i've got my left hand in my pocket i'm only going to use one hand to probe around here only one hand please uh, get that as a habit make uh, form it as a habit do not measure 
two-handed like this uh, if you're not uh, very comfortable with what you're doing if you're not aware with what you're doing rather measure with one hand so I'm gonna plug the power in let's just get that in and I'm gonna switch it on you can hear the power supply and there is our jingle so first things first we want to see if we're getting voltage out on here I've switched it to DC voltage I'm going to measure on the D plus side and we can see I've got 222 volts of DC going out to the LEDs now remember what they do they put all the LEDs in series because that way it's even current through all the LEDs therefore even brightness so we just have a look there again one hand 220 volts going out coming back zero volt so let's have a look at our current sense resistor zero volts if I can get it in there okay oops okay across that resistor there we have a full 220 volts let's have a look at our uh, MOSFET I'm just going to get it in here to measure the gate we have 5 volts on the gate that means we have switched that MOSFET on we'll measure the drain 0 and let's see if we can measure the source zero perfect so that MOSFET is switching on but we've got zero volt on our current sense resistor or zero volts on our, uh, our drain so we just come back to the LED we've got 220 volts going out so we've got 220 volts going out but we've got zero volts coming back and this MOSFET is switched on that tells me we have an open LED so what I'm going to do I'm going to take all the support so we can get to the LEDs and I'm just going to draw a little circuit of what we have here so that we can uh, that you can follow what I'm actually talking about so let's do that quickly right here we have our LED strip out I've just removed the covers that come over uh, the light deflectors that come over the LEDs all I'm going to do I'm going to switch my multimeter to diode mode and we're going to just go and check every LED and it's relatively very simple if we start from here if I do this you can see the LED lights up so that one's fine that one is a short so let us mark it mm. helps if I get a pen that is oh well uh, how am I gonna mark it let's see if I can mark it with tip X no okay doesn't matter we'll just go through it quickly so that one is short that one lights 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 
lights short open lights and lights so we've got four leds at least one two four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve so four to twelve twenty five percent gone so i'm not even going to bother testing any further because as i've said before leds are current driven devices what i'm going to do is i'm going to replace them but what i've done is i've done a little bit of a reverse engineering on the board so let's have a look at that quickly right so we said we had our d plus voltage going out goes through all our leds in series and if we remember correctly here we measured 224 volt dc and here we measured zero volt dc our circuit for this system is actually rather very simple we have an input voltage uh, 220 vol volts in this case through our led string smoothing capacitor through an inductor that we saw through the flyback diode through the fet through that big current sensing resistor we have a resistor that goes off and another one there are this is going to an ic on the bottom side of the board but if you remember or remember correctly at that point there we measured five volt dc we measured 220 volt dc up there but here we measured zero volt dc and we can see that because as we've been testing the diodes some of them lit up some of them were dead short and some of them were just open so even if this is switched on because that's open the circuit is is broken uh, the chip that they've got in here it's actually very easy it's a constant current uh, driver led driver with a fixed off time what that means is that the off time over here is a fixed period what will vary to give us more current that's why we have this current sense resistor here so as more current flows through here the voltage on that side will build up and go back to that ic the ic will make this pulse with longer or shorter as we can see depending how much more current it needs to drive obviously that will be based on its uh, pulse width modulation the inductor for that circuit uh, what we expect to see is the ripple current doing that so it's never going to zero in other words there's always a constant current flowing through here always a con constant current flowing through here even when that switches off the fed can switch off remember the inductor is now built up a magnetic field the fed switches off the field collapses it's fine the current will still flow and that is what this is doing on off on well off on off on off on off on to give us that wave through our inductor the problem is if we remember we looked at our our uh, uh, board it will give us 135 volts and 425 milliamps i haven't got leds that are in that package that can handle that so we're going to do a little bit of uh, reverse engineering what we need to do is we need to change that uh, resistor value that current sense resistor because the leds i've got are uh, 60 milliamp over here uh, the uh, LEDs that they've got in are probably rated for 500 milliamp or whatever not to worry because 
the LEDs I have are high efficiency and just as bright so I'm not worried about that so what we need to do is obviously replace I'm going to replace all the LEDs because like I said they are current driven devices so I'm going to replace them all one go that we start with new LEDs we're going to change that resistor value to give us a current protection of 60 milliamps instead of 425 milliamps through the uh, through the through the LED string so that we won't burn our LEDs out um, and we are going to have to change that inductor because that's swinging uh, based on a 425 milliamp load so that is swinging to do that now we're going to put 60 milliamps through here definitely the inductor is going to fall to zero the current will fall to zero and that means we don't have a constant current through here that means we won't have the brightness that we need and 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 a few things anyway uh, let me just show you how I'm going to take the LEDs out it's very very simple all I'm going to do I'm going to take my heat gun heat them up like that from the bottom side because you can see it's got one big huge earth plate uh, ground plate so if I heat them up from the bottom I can just lift the faulty ones well I'm going to lift all these ones off and we can put new ones in so I'm going to do that off camera because it's going to take a bit of time and once I've replaced the uh, all the LEDs we'll come back and test our strings and see what we have from there right we have uh, successfully replaced all these LEDs and there you can see all the LEDs we took off what I'm going to do uh, just to show you these are 60 milliamp rated LEDs uh, what I've done is I've set my bench power supply uh, roughly to 36 volts uh, limiting well limiting the current to 20 milliamp obviously to do this with this power supply I need to put the two channels in uh, series not a problem all I'm going to do is I'm just going to power each bar so that you can get an idea on how bright it is sorry for the the leads it is what it is you can see that's relatively bright that's only one third of the current rated current so these are definitely going to be all right uh, let's come to the next one perfect all the LEDs working even brightness and the last one perfect again even brightness remember this is only running at uh, 20 milliamp which is one third of the rate of the current of the LED and uh, I can tell you looking at it directly uh, brings spots to my eyes so what I'm going to do I'm going to put these well first of all we're going to come back to the theory in a little bit and we're going to modify our power supply uh, to accommodate these new LEDs remember we said these are 60 milliamp rated these are 2835s so you buy them on a reel uh, here in South Africa much cheaper than trying to buy the uh, original components the original components are 35 35s in other words they are 3.5 mil high by 3.5 mil uh, wide I suspect that they are minimum 500 milliamp to probably an amp because the power supply is limited to 425 milliamp as we saw these are only 60 so now we have to uh, convince or tell our power supply that actually hang on you are working with something less therefore we should be able to drive you properly and uh, 
So let me do that and let's get the power supply out. Let's uh, do some modifications. Those we'll do together. Um, just a few uh, uh, words here. Uh, all I did, like I said, is I heated it up with my heat gun below, obviously uh, uh, like that. Took it off with a tweezer. I didn't clean the excess solder. What I did from there is I used uh, just a little bit of this uh, flux. So on the bare pad, I just put flux and put the new LED because there is more than enough solder uh, left over. The, 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 the flux will just get that to flow nicely and it actually flows very nicely. Um, and over there are four that I had left. Uh, if you're wondering, they come on a, a reel. Well, you can't really see uh, like this. Uh, I stuffed up, I bought the waterproof one. So what they've done is they've coated this whole thing with silicon and then in there is a silicon tube that goes over it. So you have to remove that. Don't buy the waterproof ones. Um, the 2835 versus the uh, 3528, the same thing, same height, same width. The only thing is the 2835 is a 60 milliamp LED, whereas the 3528 is a 30 milliamp LED. This is a high efficiency LED, apparently. That's what they've changed. So, uh, for the same current, you get less heat produced, apparently. Anyway, this is the flavor of the day. They are relatively cheap. I think the roll with the waterproofing and everything, uh, five meter strip, uh, 300 LEDs is about 340 something rand at Communica. Anyway, let's come back to the theory, uh, the, the fun part, a little bit of maths, and we'll modify our power board. Right. As we've said, uh, here is our, our circuit. Importantly, we're worried about this component here, yeah, this current sense resistor, which is currently 2 ohm for uh, 425 milliamp, and that inductor there. That inductor currently is 2 millihenry of inductance, and uh, what we said is this chip is a fixed off time, so our off time is fixed, but our on time varies to give us uh, the current flow that we require through the inductor. Remember we said uh, all things being equal, that is off, no current is flowing. When that switch is on, the current will flow through the inductor, through the FET, through that current sensing resistor down to ground the voltage will build up here because uh, V equals IR, Ohm's law, so the voltage across that resistor will build up. It will drive the current sense pin of the uh, IC that is controlling this and it will know whether it has uh, should switch more or less. Uh, also, it will know if one of these LEDs has shorted out, we'll have more current, we'll have less voltage. Uh, uh, more volt drop appearing here, so it's a protection pin as well. Uh, I'm going to give you the data sheet so that you can look at this up in your leisure. I don't want to spend too much time on it. So we said the FET now switches on, everything was dead. Well, the voltage was here, but the FET was off. So here we've got 220 volts, no current flow. The FET switches on, the current flows through the LEDs, through the inductor through the FET, there will be a, a volt drop because that has an RDS, uh, RDS on value. Uh, don't worry too much. We're not going to worry about uh, taking the volt drop across the FET or the volt drop across the uh, shot key diode into account. We're interested in there. The current will flow through that resistor. Magic, the voltage will build up here and so we will switch this thing on or we'll keep the FET on more or less. Uh, as the current is flowing through our inductor, the magnetic field is building. Great, the current is now stored 
it's still flowing, but uh, the excess current or charge is now stored in that magnetic field. The FET will switch off for its fixed off time. That magnetic field will start collapsing. Great, it will drive more current through uh, to power it during that off cycle. The FET will then switch on again and we'll have uh, the magnetic field building up and so we would see this wave form at the bottom and uh, notice it's never going to zero the problem is this fit and this resistor has been sized for uh, the 425 milliamps on the board we are now working with 16 milliamps luckily uh, the data sheet for this chip, I've done a bit of homework for you, is a MAP3511 average current control buck controller for the LED backlight. If you do scrape the marking, uh, the silicon snot grease that they put over the chip on the back, you will not find much any uh, any information on that chip. You will have a, I think it's a uh, dash 0335 and that is the only marking on the chip luckily i found a website uh, unfortunately in polish or russian uh, acrylic but these guys have done some reverse engineering for the specific power board and they had worked out that it was this chip and uh funny enough when I looked at the circuit for the chip and versus what we reverse engineered, it turned out to be the same. So I'm going to take it as it is the same. So we need to change our two ohm resistor here, our current sense. And uh, if we look through the data sheet, we have a bit of maths. They give us the formula of this current sense resistor is uh, 0.5075 times the uh, voltage for the dimmer or the dimmer voltage divided by the current for the LED uh, we plug in our numbers uh, 0.5075 5 times 3 3 is when the backlight is at its brightest divided by our 60 milliamps we need a 25 ohm resistor 25 ohms well I could just chuck in the nearest uh, E24 value, but because I've got E24 values, if I put uh, a 47 ohm and a 56 ohm resistor in parallel, uh, do the maths for a parallel uh, resistor circuit, one divided by all the reciprocal of 47, the reciprocal of 56, the sum of that, uh, the reciprocal of the total, that will give you 25.53 ohm. Close enough, I'm happy with that. Um, where they get those values on the data sheet, let me just uh, try and zoom in here. As we can see, they talk about the current sense and dimming. Uh, ADIM input voltage 0.5 to 3 volt. And uh, the voltage for the current sense, if the dim voltage is 0.5 volts, uh, that's what we will get the minimum uh, 0.2512 or max 2.2563, uh, whatever, work on the minimum. If you do a little bit of maths without any of the stuff and you uh, uh, take these voltages into account and you work it back, you will calculate that you need roughly about um, 25 ohm. Uh, we talk about here, yeah, what I've done is a little bit of a calculation uh, before I actually saw the formulas. Uh, 25 ohm for 60 milliamps at 3 volts. Will be perfect will give us that 1.5 volt uh, drop uh, funny enough at the 0.5 where the dimming circuit if you were using the voltage dimming uh, that 25 ohm uh, for 10 milliamps will give us uh, that volt drop um, further on in the data sheet uh, they actually give us the formula helps if you read uh, the data sheet, uh, the current sense resistor is 0.5075, which is the ratio uh, that they're talking about between the uh, dim voltage and the current sense voltage uh, times the volt, uh, dim voltage setting uh, divided by the current for the LED. 
so this chip works in a ratio it's not uh, not like uh, we thought um, so we know now we need to change that current sense resistor to 25 ohms if we change it to 25 ohms well uh, roughly at the, the uh, 60 milliamps we're going to pull 92 milliwatts a quarter ohm resistors are fine not the big two or three watt uh, resistor that they've got in there of course we have to do a bit of uh, maths to calculate uh, forget what is up yeah well let's have a look currently we have a two milli henry uh, inductor in there and that is definitely not going to handle our ripple current typically we want a, a ripple current of 30 percent of our rated current going through there so if i'm going to pull 60 milliamps 30 percent of that is what i want to be my ripple in other words from the peak to peak the ripple must be 18 milliamps that means the inductor is never going to zero and we have a constant current our problem being is we only have a two milliamp inductor in there Ach, correction sorry about that two milli henry inductor in there and that is going to be far too little because that uh, that inductor if you think of it two milli henry um, the board says it will handle uh, 425 milliamps, so let's say 30% of that. So easily uh, 300 milliamp ripple. Well, if we put our little 60 milliamp in, what is going to happen? The inductor will charge. We will see this. I'm, we're actually going to hook it up to a scope and see if I'm right. So what we'll see is the voltage building up across the inductor and will collapse to zero. And it will go for the off time and then it will build up again during the on time and collapse to zero and then during the off time be zero and we are not going to get well the effect of that is we are not going to get a constant current flow through our, our leds so the leds will be much dimmer uh, to calculate the inductor for a buck circuit simply put you need to know the duty of the inductor now, i'm not going to go too deeply into this this is derived this will get you into the uh into the ballpark uh, if you'd like to uh, know a bit more about inductors and how they they work because they're different formulas for buck and for boost typically you need to know the duty in other words our voltage out divided by our voltage in will give us our duty in our case 0 0.703 if we want to know the ripple we said well my delta that little triangle is delta 60 milliamps times 30 percent is 80 milliamp 18 milliamp so that's the ripple that i want the inductance i need for that is uh, the input uh, voltage minus the out uh, yes the input voltage minus the output voltage i'm reading over the camera excuse me uh, multiplied by the duty divided by the uh, ripple that we wanted through the inductor the delta current delta i through the inductor times the switching frequency if we do the maths 192 volts well 192 we can say 220 it will just bring our induct uh, inductance down which is not going to hurt us but anyway 192 minus 135 times the 0 0.703 the duty divided by the current the ripple current times our switching frequency which i think is 50 kilohertz i may be wrong if the switching frequency is higher uh, that's all the better for us the less inductance that we require anyway i've worked it out that we need 44.5 millihenries of inductance uh, note it must be able to carry the 60 milliamp dc that we require the other thing to select in the inductor is to make sure it can handle the uh, excuse me the peak current that we is going to go through here as well as the uh, resonant 
frequency of the inductor. If we are switching at 50 kilohertz, we don't want an inductor with a self-resonant frequency of 1 kilohertz. We want it at least uh, 10 times bigger. So if, if we were at 50 kilohertz, uh, we want our, our self-resonant frequency of the inductor to be at least 500 kilohertz. Um, I'm not going to go into the why, the wherefore, the how now. If you want to know, please leave it in the com comments below. I'm showing you what we need to do to modify the circuit and how we can do that. Um, you can download the data sheet for this. It explains everything in there. Uh, it is a little bit confusing because it looks like it is a, a Chinese knockoff chip. So the uh, English or Chinglish is, is delicious, but that is no problem. You can work it out from the circuitry as well as the block diagram that they provide. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to whip the power supply out. Right, here's our power supply board. Here's the FET that we were talking about that we measured. That is on. Here is our current sense resistor, the 2 ohm that we're going to change. We'll leave that inductor in there, that 2 millihenry inductor and what we'll do if I just take uh, this off is we will solder uh, two leads across it uh, so that we can hook up our uh, oscilloscope so we can see the waveform uh, there is the chip that is doing the control. As you can see, it's all snotted in. It's got this uh, silicon gluey snot on. I don't know why they do that. Um, but anyway, let me change the resistor. We'll, I'll solder two leads on that we can uh, probe this thing and we'll come back and see what we see. Right, I have uh, replaced uh, this little resistor down there and as you would have seen earlier uh, we calculated that we need a 25 ohm resistor and uh, I've made the mistake of not thinking this through properly. So I calculated that resistor, if you remember we calculated it together using a DC current flow for an LED and we fell straight into that trap that that Australian fellow will call the trap for young players. What we should have been working on is peak current. So, yeah, my mistake. I uh, replaced it with a 25 ohm resistor. Actually, we needed far less. And we'll come back to the calculations for that. And um, what I had in here is I had the 25 ohm resistor. Uh, I switched it on, it was very dim, and I started changing the inductances, and uh, um, it just didn't get any brighter. And then I started realizing, but hang on, hang on, we've made a mistake. So let me show you what we're going to do. I've got my oscilloscope channel 1, the yellow trace, uh, connected to that uh, current sense resistor. Channel 2, the blue probe, we have got connected to the gate of the uh, MOSFET so we can see when it turns on. So let me jack it up, we'll look at the scope together and I will sh explain to you why and how, what went wrong. So here's our scope, our device is off. I've unplugged the main board. So the only thing that is now happening is we've got power coming into the power board. Uh, the power board is driving the LEDs. In other words, the pulse width modulation dimming control from the main board is disabled. As we can see when I switch it on, there comes our pulse waves. Well, actually not. What we're seeing is channel 1, the yellow channel. So let's change the time base here a bit. And let's bring channel 2 in. And we'll bring channel 2 down a bit. And we'll 
just uh, we can leave and just set our trigger up um yeah that looks fine to me so if we look at channel two the blue the high edge is where the MOSFET is switched on in other words the inductor is charging we can see that the voltage build up onto that resistor the MOSFET switches off and that collapses now let's use our scope to uh, make some guesses what we can see on channel 2 we've got the blue channel set to uh, 5 volts of division, so typically ah, it's just over 5, 10, uh, say 12 volts between the off and the on pulse, so 12 volts to switch the, uh, the MOSFET on. Uh, the yellow trace is set to uh, 1 volt of division, so it's 1, uh, almost 2, so say 1.6 volts uh, peak from there to there uh, forget these little uh, spikes where it switches on let us go to channel one and let us look at uh, some vertical measurements now typically we would think we're going to use the rms value uh, that rms value and that's what our multimeter would be measuring. So uh, let us put our RMS value on. And on the bottom it shows us there 870 millivolts. And that is wrong. Let us go and uh, I'm just going to switch my multimeter on. Let's see if we can uh, have it in the screen here. I'm just going to measure over that resistor now. And you can see we're measuring 716 millivolts, not the 870. So that is another trap there for young and old players alike. What we actually need to look at is the average voltage perfect and that is what our multimeter is working or measuring so by using the dc rated current of the led i stuffed up this calculation and put in a resistor that was way too high and then played around with a uh, inductor that i didn't need to so what really interests us, if we look at the spec for a similar LED, I'm going to just call it up here on my iPad so you won't uh, see it, but I will read it to you. Uh, cool white 2835s, uh, power dissipation 0.2 milliwatts, we don't care about that. Continuous forward current 60 milliamp, 60 milliamp DC, and that is what we were using for our calculation and that is a huge mistake what we should have used is the uh what do they call it the have i lost it now it looks like it what we should have used is the peak forward current one tenth of the duty cycle 0.1 millisecond pulse width which is 180 milliamps now what that means uh, one tenth of the duty cycle and uh, 0.1 millisecond pulse width is if we look at the top up here now we can see uh, our base time is uh, 10 uh, microseconds per division so if we look here um, let me try and find a good one or I could just move it over it doesn't matter that one is there so we're looking at uh, one two graticules of the uh, 10 microseconds so basically our off time is four microseconds out of 
Um, yeah. So we off for four microseconds. Remember, we said the chip is uh, is a fixed off time, and we are roughly on for one full ten microseconds. And it looks like, uh, give or take, another point two. So uh, we are on for eighteen microseconds. So we're way below the ten or one millisecond that the data sheet requires. So we fulfill that. So if we go and do the maths now, and we take, well, if I get my calculator, and we take this average uh, voltage, which I will do here. So let's just take our fixed off. So we say it's 0.720 divided by a 4.7 ohm resistor that I've got in, we're only pulling 153 uh, milliamp. So that is way below our, our 180 milliamp specified by the data sheet as the peak. Uh, the LEDs are very bright. Let's see if we can uh, jack you down and you can see that. We'll zoom out a bit. Uh, just come down a little bit. Sorry for the bumping. Uh, we can take that off. That uh, white space lit up there behind. If I can just change my white balance in the is what the LEDs are lighting up and trust me it is very bright what we could do we'll just come down to the board again sorry for the bumping is that resistor down there that we changed we could make it a 0.3 ohm ah, not 0.3 a 3 ohm or 3.3 ohm resistor come back and measure and if our current is still fine We'll leave it with a 3 ohm, that will give us our maximum brightness. Because what has happened, if you notice over here, that cable that was here goes to the uh, board down there, the main board, and that has got our pulse with uh, modulation dimming control. And I've disconnected it. So now what we're running in is a, a free oscillator. Basically, the uh, controller is running on its own at its maximum output so minimum well it's fixed off time with maximum on time so we're not giving it any pulse so this is the the maximum brightness without pulse with modulation dimming interference so what i'm going to do i'm going to change the resistor here we'll set it up the same we'll come back and look and do the calcs together and we'll see what we see all right we're back and as luck would have it i didn't have any 3.3 .3 ohm resistors uh, but what i did have is a, s a bunch of 7.5 so if you can see nicely in there i have uh, just put two 7.5 resistor in uh, parallel which would give us 3.75 um close enough it gives us a little bit of he uh, headroom i've measured the resistance across there it gives us uh, four ohms so the moment of truth, I'm going to just zoom out. I haven't switched it on yet. And uh, we'll do that together. And hopefully it won't go bang. So let me put the power in. But I shouldn't. I have our oscilloscope probes in the same place. So here we go. Not much notice difference in uh, brightness. Let's uh, have a look at our oscilloscope. Uh, sorry for the bumping us. Um, let's just get you up. As already. So there we are. And if we zoom in, not uh, not that much difference in our average voltage. Uh, 
and if I go and measure it with the multimeter, uh, you won't be able to see, but I will tell you it is uh, 0.735. And if we do that, the maths, 0.735 divided by the four ohms of resistance, 183 million P. Perfect. So that is about as far as we want to go with dropping these resistors. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to jack you down a little bit. Excuse the bumpiness. I really need to get one of those... Uh, Uh, so, to show you what I'm going to do, why is that one? What I'm going to do is I'm going to plug well, first I'm going to switch it off. I'm going to plug the main board in so we can see what the difference is now with the pulse width modulation. So, to give you an idea, let's just lock the brightness there. That's how bright it is at the moment. Let me switch it off. We'll plug the main board back in. And we'll switch it on. And if we measure our resistance or our voltage up there, 0 0.337. So that has dropped our current quite a bit, 0.337 divided by the 4, 84 milliamp. So it's hard, our current. Not a problem, it still looks relatively bright. What I'm going to do, I'm going to put the needle end caps and we'll put the TV back together and then we'll come and have a look and see. Right, we've assembled the TV and now we come to the moment of truth. Let us switch the power on. Perfect, we've got a working backlight. Um, so the first thing I advise you to do is go into this thing. Let's see how do you, okay, like that. And let's turn the backlight down till it's not really noticeable. Okay, I don't think it's. 20 to 19 to 18 to 17 to 16 to 15 14 to 13, 14 13 12 we can is it me I can't really know out there okay I'm going to set it to 15 for now ideally you want to do this with a with a picture or oh, we can still work on that uh, or we can work on 
on that. But I think it looks fine. Obviously, I should connect a, a signal to it. Anyway, what we do know is with the main board connected, we are running with their pulse width modulation dimming at 20% of, well, not 20%, uh, at 50%. In other words, with the pulse width modulation dimming from the board, we're running at eight, uh, 80 milliamp, where we actually set our current sensing resistor for um, 160 milliamp or 180 milliamp so we're running at less than uh, less than 50 percent which is fine these brand new LEDs should be fine with that um, I guess you're all waiting for the uh, important uh, part what would this repair have cost so let me set the uh, camera up and we'll come to the closing shot we'll discuss the costs and in rea reality what this would have this repair would have cost the components and labor etc 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 right we come to the end of another repair not uh, difficult not complex uh, we went a little bit down the rabbit hole my own fault um, Anyway, let's get to the important things. So, the cost of the repair, what it ideally should have cost you. Uh, bear in mind the TV costs 4,820 Rand if you can buy it. So, five Rand, but let's work on 4,820. Uh, the LEDs. Now, you can buy a, a replacement LED kit for this TV. Uh, costs, excuse me, roughly about 354 Rand, uh, excluding the delivery, and you can get it from AliExpress or someone like that. But if you live in South Africa, the chances of the bloody thing arriving are nil. Um, ask me, I know I've ordered this uh, replacement kit for this specific TV um, in... November last year, it hasn't arrived, okay? So, uh, going that route in South Africa is not, not viable anymore. Unfortunately, with our post office and, and, and everything there, uh, things just don't arrive, unless you can um, DHL it to your door. Um, but the problem is the cost of the DHL far outweighs the cost or the value of the good being ordered. So, what I did is I went i just happened to be at communica uh, buying some other stuff and i saw these led strips uh, and they had roughly the same dimensions as the leds in here the leds in here originally in here are 35 35 the package 3.5 mil by 3.5 mil you can buy them from rs components again another balls up in south africa because everything is on back order uh, roughly, you're looking at uh, four and an LED from RS components. So I thought I'd try the 2835, which is the newer version of the 3528. I don't know why they've done it, but uh, bear with me. All it is, it's the same uh, LED as the 3528, just a higher efficiency. Uh, the luminosity range or the, the color range is uh, roughly about six thousand which is what we want ideally for tv backlight um it's a nice uh, uh white bright white uh, to blue white uh, if that makes sense you can look it up on google anyway you can buy that roll from communica which is not cheap either uh, but if you can get it from communica it seems these led strips are quite a common thing now you could buy it from builders wherever off you go um it's a five meter roll. Roughly, you've got 60 LEDs per meter, which gives you 300 LEDs. The LED strip from Communica was 340 Rand. We used 42 LEDs in this TV. Remember, you can't, uh, well, I'm not, if it's me doing the repair, and if it's 
if you're looking for advice, I'm telling you to replace all the LEDs because LEDs are current driven. Uh, if one in the string fails, uh, you are going to weaken the other ones. If we break the cost down uh, roughly on a, on a five meter roll, you're looking at one rand 13 per LED. Really, it's nothing. Um, we used 42 LEDs in this uh, TV. Um, two of the strips have got uh, 15 LEDs and the middle strip has got 12 LEDs. <laughs> so 1 and 13 an LED, that will give you a total cost of, uh, of the LEDs, 47 Rand 46 cents. Uh, the resistors, uh, let's work on 14 cents a component. We used two 7.5 ohm resistors to give us a 3.75 or 4 ohm. Um, uh, 28 cents, 14 cents a resistor. Uh, consumables, uh, this is just a, a thing I'm, I'm throwing in for the solder that I'm using, the, um, uh, the IPA for cleaning, the uh, solder braid for removing excess uh, solder, etc., etc. So consumables, let's say, twelve rand fifty. That thumb suck. Sounds fine. Twelve rand fifty for consumables. That gives us a total hardware cost or component cost to fix this TV of sixty rand twenty four cents. Doesn't sound much, does it? Uh, considering the TV cost. 4,820. Let's, because it's not a complex device, it's, I'm not trying to repair uh, something more complex than this. Uh, let's say uh, you have a service fee of 500 Rand for that. Um, if I have to charge you to repair it, uh, because it's a TV, uh, we're going to repair to component level. It's not a, a majorly complex thing. Um, yeah, 500 Rand. So total cost 560 Rand 24 cents. Uh, that works out to be 12% of the TV's value. Now, if you think uh, that 500 um, uh, uh, Rand, 560 Rand is expensive to repair your TV, or the 500 Rand is an expensive labor component, um, you know what? I know where to look for the fault. Uh, you pay me for that. Uh, it's knowing where the fault is um, and how to fix it. Uh, to put that into perspective, if we take our current exchange rate, 560 Rand, you're looking at about 30, uh, 30 35 US dollars. Um, from what I understand, you will not get a shop uh, electronic repair shop in the States to look at anything for less than 50 US dollars. That's just to look at it, not, not to fix it. So my model is a little bit different. If I was doing this for a living, I'm charging you the 500 uh, Rand service fee to tell you what the fault is, to find the fault, and then you decide if you want to go further. Obviously the 500 is uh, non-refundable. Um, and then you paying the components on top of that. That's just for a little Mickey Mouse TV like this. Uh, so I don't think that is a bad model. Why I'm doing this costing exercise, I'm trying to give you an idea. Obviously, with the state that we are in in this country, uh, repair is going to become a more a viable option instead of uh, replacement. Uh, replacement is going to be very expensive i think it's uh once we get through all this uh, the specials off offloading all this stock and things like that and uh when you start getting to pay normal prices again where people are trying to cut each other's throats to stay alive uh, i don't think you're going to get the discounted value on con on consumer goods that you used to get so i think you're going to start looking at repair this will give you a good idea if you're taking your device or your, your product to somebody to repair, if I can give you a good idea what the, uh, the 
the the the the, 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 the part cost is, and the, the labor cost, uh, you have a good idea whether you're being ripped off or not. So like I say, 560 bucks to repair this, uh, TV cost 4.8, uh, roughly 12% of the value to repair it. By replacing all the LEDs, we know that this uh, TV is good for at least another 10,000 hours. Roughly, that's the, 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 the lifespan of the LEDs. Anyway, back to the technical side of it. Yes, I went down the uh, rabbit hole. Instead of thinking that we are working with uh, uh, pulse width modulation, not const constant current, so now we can work with uh, peak current. I uh, sort of stuffed up and way overestimated the resistor values. And then obviously thinking about it and coming back to doing the maths, finding out, oh, we can drive it to the peak. Peak, obviously, in this case, being 180 milliamp. Fine, we can change the, the resistor value. Uh, the original resistor was 2 ohms. We went to 3.754 ohm, as it works out, because the, the resistance have a tolerance. And it will handle the power. The inductor, we didn't have to change, because the inductor typically in the frequency range that they're working with uh, it's got uh, quite a big tolerance as well 20 percent roughly um, calculated inductance that we needed going back with our resistor change and these leds we needed to go to a roughly uh, four well three point something milli henry inductor is it worth buying the inductor again? I would have to buy it through RS components because it's not something that's available off the shelf. To give you a cost of that, the inductor would have cost uh, 28 Rand 64 cents, excluding VAT. Add another 90 Rand onto that, or 100 Rand for delivery. Uh, so for one little in measly inductor, we would have pushed up our cost by, say, 130 Rand. Is it worth it? Anyway, as always, I hope you found this uh, fun. I hope you found it in interesting. I hope you found it entertaining. Um, now that I know that we can use these LEDs, I've got a backload of uh, other TVs, similar problems. We can go ahead confidently and sort them out although there are some with other problems but mainly first uh, backlight and then we can sort out the other issues as we go along uh, as always take care be safe and we'll catch you in the next one cheers